nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So in the next section, uh, we're going to go through a review of scientific programming in C and Fortran. It's pretty hard for me to like teach you the whole of the both languages, and I'm not trying to do that. But what I'm trying to do is show you some example code just so that you get a sense of what's there. And also, you can always look back in the notes and cheat and copy things out because, you know, probably stuff is very similar. So at least you'll, you'll have seen it once. In order to kind of walk you through it and give you a, a problem to look at, um, we're going to create a Monte Carlo simulator uh, for this Plinko game. You guys ever see the Plinko thing? You go to the, like the, the fair, county fair or something, and there's this game where uh, there's a bunch of pegs on a board, and you drop something down the pegs, and the, and the, the coin kind of stutters around, and then eventually falls into a uh, spot at the bottom, right? And uh, yeah, they do this on the prices right, right? If you get into the middle spot, you like win the big prize, the, the grand showcase. Uh, and nobody can ever get exactly on that one spot. But anyway, uh, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is build a simulator that kind of simulates that motion. And the idea is we're gonna follow a coin, you drop it from the top, it comes down, and each time it hits a peg, we're going to assume that there's an even 50-50 chance that it will go left or right. Now, of course, in real life, it's not exactly that, um, because the pegs might be slightly off, and there's all kinds of other factors. Uh, but our very simple model just kind of chooses a 50-50 chance when it hits a peg. And then it goes down and hits the next peg square on, and there's a 50-50 chance of going left or right. So. What we can do is drop thousands of coins and simulate thousands of paths through this. And at the end, we can count up where all the coins land. Uh, so we're going to keep buckets at the bottom, and we're going to drop thousands of virtual coins down through, uh, through this system. And we'll see where most of them tend to end up. Um, and the, uh, they call this Monte Carlo simulation. In fact, it, it's used a lot in scientific stuff. Um, they call it Monte Carlo simulation because it's like gambling. It's like going to Monte Carlo. You spin the wheel and you see what happens. Uh, and here we're spinning the wheel like thousands and thousands of times. Turns out you can use the same strategy if you want to figure out how electrons move through uh, little transistors. You can do the same thing. You shoot the electrons in one at a time, and you say, well, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but for this particular track, it's going to bump into an atom, and it's going to get hit by a phonon, and it's going to go through the oxide, and you, you do all this random stuff. And if you do that for thousands and thousands of electrons, it turns out you can actually simulate a device pretty accurately. That's one strategy for doing simulation. Um, other strategies involve a lot of calculus and differential equations, and all of a sudden you can appreciate the Monte Carlo thing because it's a whole lot easier to think about. So that's my general setup. You can imagine, you know, your advisor hands you this program, tells you that's how it works, and here's the code. And what I want to do is not so much explain to you how the Plinko simulator works, but I want to kind of show off the features of C language in case you saw a program like this that implements something like that. All right, so first of all, when you look at a C language program, one of the first things you see near the top are a series of pound include statements. Um, the pound include statements are the ways of bringing in the libraries that you need for running a program. And what I've got here are, are three very standard libraries. Uh, STDIO is the standard input output. STDLib is just a bunch of standard library functions. And math.h is all the math functions. Of course, Monte Carlo simulator, we're going to be doing a lot of math functions here. So we need that. Um, you can bring in other files, too. Usually when it's a standard file, you put it in diamond braces. Uh, that's the compiler likes that, looks for it in standard places. But if you, you can also bring in whatever files you want just by putting a file name in quotes. Um, so whenever you want to bring code in, kind of as if it was included in line, you use a pound include for that. And that defines all the functions and the variables and stuff. You can also define constants. Um, so in this case, our Plinko has, is going to have nine levels of pegs. So we're, we're, we've got a system with nine levels. You might write the program, hard code it with nine everywhere, and then your advisor comes back and says, well, I want to try 11 levels. And you're like, no, you have to go back and fix your program, right? So sometimes instead of hard coding numbers in, it's better to put parameters in like that. This acts as if it's hard coded. Uh, what the compiler does with the pound define is everywhere in your code that it sees the word levels, it will literally substitute nine in place of it. 
just before it compiles everything. So all it's doing is a textual substitution of whatever you've got up there, wherever it sees levels. And by convention, in C language, people use all capital letters for that because they want it to be easy to spot in the code where these substitutions are happening. You don't want to get confused. You could define all kinds of stuff and like you could redefine the word char in C language and then all hell would break loose in your program because you'd make, be making substitutions and trying to figure out what the compiler's doing and it's very confusing. So people tend to use all uppercase letters for, for their pound defines just to make it real obvious that this is just a text substitution thing. Yeah, and just to emphasize that point, you can see the two spots in my code where I've got the word levels, that just gets substituted with nine. So I can size my arrays according to levels, and I can loop through the loop according to levels and all that. All right. Now we're getting down into the actual code of the program. A main program in C is, looks like this. It, it's defined as a function called main, and it has to have um, two uh, arguments, an integer argc and uh, char star star argv. Uh, the stars in C language are, are references to pointers. In this case, this is a pointer to a pointer of characters. That's how you represent an array of strings, basically, in C language. Um, if you don't understand all that, that's okay. Just copy that because that's what your function prototype needs to look like in main. That's what your, your C language is. And you don't need to worry about that argc and argv stuff unless you actually use the arguments in the program. The arguments, when you call a program in the command line and you give it all the extra words, those are the arguments. And argc tells you how many arguments there are on the command line, and argv gives you all the different strings for the arguments on the command line. Um, so anyway, you just make a function like that called main, and that's your main program, and it always returns an int. The integer it returns is an integer status code that says whether your program succeeded or failed. So if, if it returns zero, everything's okay, and if it returns anything other than zero, something went wrong. And on Unix, there's all kinds of different status codes that tell you what might have gone wrong in a program with different numbers that it can return. So, you want to write hello world or whatever? You start with a function like that. All right. Now, just like in MATLAB yesterday, we need to get some input into the program. And the way that a lot of people get input into the program, again, they prompt the user, they ask them questions, and they read things from, for example, standard input. So the way you can do that in C language, there's a printf function, formatted print. Printf, in this case, I just gave it a simple string, number of drops. The backslash n is a new line. So just read that as a carriage return or a new line. So it's going to print out number of drops with a question mark and then go down to the next line. And uh, then the scanf function is a way of reading in from standard in. Scanf is sort of the opposite of printf. Printf prints out, scanf reads in, but it reads in according to a format. And the format here is percent %d, means look for a decimal number, and put the result in the word max. And scanf at the end returns a value which tells you how many things it was able to successfully scan. So if I'm in good shape, it will read a number, a decimal number, it will put it into the variable called max, and then it'll return the value 1. And I'll know, if, some, if I didn't return the value 1, then something went wrong. Somebody typed in XYZ, or they didn't type anything, or something went wrong. Um, so in this case, I'm looking at scanf saying, well, if it's not equal to 1, then I print out bad number, and then I exit. Um, there's all these different flavors, just like yesterday with MATLAB, there's, we can see there's an fprintf flavor for printf. fprintf prints out to a particular file, in this case standard error is a way of putting out messages. So, but again, all of these are very similar. printf just prints out to the normal standard output, fprintf with standard error prints out to standard error, but in both cases you just give it a string like that, bad number or something, maybe a new line at the end, and it prints out. And then exit, exit 1 will exit the program and with a status code of 1. It's kind of like returning from the main program with 1. It basically stops your program and signals an error. Yeah, and I wrote that down there. So whenever you're ending your program, um, you really should either return 0 or exit 0. Exit 0 means OK. I always remember it that way. Zero is okay, and everything else is, f is failure. One, two, ten, one, one million and twenty-seven, whatever you want to return is, is a failure. All right, now this is how you do a for loop. 
in C language. Um, and it's a little different than some other languages. The for loop in C language kind of has three parts to it, and they're separated by semicolons. The first part sets up what happens before the loop starts. So in this case, it says i equals zero. So at the beginning of the loop, it sets i equals zero. And then as it's going through the for loop again and again and again, it checks the middle part. It checks to see if i is less than levels plus one. So as long as i is less than levels plus one, it keeps going through the loop. And then the last part is done sort of right at the end of the loop to go on to the next version. So in this case, it says i plus plus, which is the C language way of saying bump the i counter. It's like saying i equals i plus one. People got tired of saying i equals i plus one all the time, so they created i plus plus um, to increment i. So, uh, so this is what it's going to do. It's going to start out with the value i equals zero. It's going to run through the loop, say uh, count zero is zero, and then it'll bump to the next i, one. And then it'll check and see, yep, I've still got room there, so keep going. Count one is zero, count two is zero, count three is zero, and it'll keep going all the way through the number of levels that I've defined. And remember, way back at the top, if I want to change the size of my program, I can redefine levels to be 27 and do a different simulation. And this will just keep going as much as it needs to. So all I'm doing there is going through that array of counts. And in this case, I'm setting all the buckets to empty. Right? Those are the buckets at the bottom of my Plinko thing. And I'm zeroing them all out to make sure they're empty. Um, oh yeah, one thing to point out, in Fortran and in MATLAB, all the indices start from one, but in C language, they start from zero. So, gotta remember, like, all your arrays start from zero in C language. All right. So here's kind of the meat of my Plinko simulator. Um, this other for loop, I start out with a drop value equals zero, and I keep going until drop is less than max. So I'm gonna keep dropping and dropping and dropping these coins. Um, and each time I, I increment the drop counter, drop plus plus. Uh, all I'm doing there is just making sure I'm doing it so many times. So basically we're dropping a coin through and at each point in the levels we're, um, we're going through all the different levels. The DRAND48 generates a random number and I'm checking to see if it's less than five or greater than five. If it's less than five then I go to the minus one side and if it's greater than five I go to the plus one side. This is kind of a funny syntax in C language, and occasionally a few other languages have borrowed it. It's a really compact way of doing an if statement. So what this does, DRAND48 generates the random number and checks to see if it's less than five. And the question mark says, if that's true, then use the value minus one, and the colon says if it's false, then use the value one. So it's a real compact way of writing an if statement. Look at that, and if it's true, use the value minus one. If it's false, use the value one. So in our case, that's like the coin hit the peg and we're deciding, do I want to go left or right? Do I want to go minus one or plus one? Either way. And in C language, you can write really dense code that way. I don't know, for better or for worse. So what I'm doing is basically with that statement, I'm figuring out either plus or minus one randomly, and then I'm adding that onto my position. I've got a statement pause plus equals plus or minus one. That means pause equals pause plus one, or pause equals pause minus one. So my pause position is gonna shift left or right. So you might see like code like that if you're looking through a C language program, and I wanted to make sure you've seen the statement before and sort of how that works. By the way, as I'm going through, if you guys are uh, uh, just, if I'm not talking about something and you wonder what something is, feel free to ask. Uh, but just kind of taking a, a general tour through C language. So this is that plus, plus equal sign that I was telling you about. When you say pause plus equals one, it's equivalent to saying pause equals pause plus one. Again, the guys who wrote C language just got tired of typing stuff out and they invented a kind of a shorter hand notation. And that's been borrowed now into a bunch of different languages. So you may have seen that in another language. Okay, so the for loop just keeps going. It keeps dropping coins through and it, until, until drop reaches the maximum count. So maybe 500 or 1,000. Uh, that was the parameter that we asked the user for. How many drops do we want to do? You could type in 1,000. And then it would go through this loop 1,000 times, each time starting at the top, generating a random number, and working its way down through the number of levels until it finally reaches the bottom, the certain position. All right, and then at the very end of this program, 
uh, you can see this little block. This is where we're printing everything out. This is the output for our program. Um, first of all, you can see there's a, a do I highlight the, yeah, the comment line. So in C language, when you want to put comments in your code, the way you do it is with slash star and then some stuff and then star slash. Um, and that's good to know and it's a little tricky because sometimes, you know, people forget they have slash star and they start typing a bunch of stuff and they forget to close it off with the star slash or they mistype the star slash. They invert the two characters or something. That comment just stays open. The C language will ignore all of the text until it sees that closing comment, the star slash at the end there. So a lot of times if you don't put that in or if you mess it up, then the compiler will just ignore three quarters of your program because it's looking for the end of a what it thinks is a gigantic comment, right? Um, modern languages now, like C++, use two slashes at the beginning of the line, or maybe a pound at the beginning of the line. That makes it easier. Then you just have a comment for the rest of the line. But in C language, it stays open until you close the comment like that. Um, so watch out for that. It's good to put comments in your code, right? Otherwise, six months from now, when you put comments in your code, you're actually writing a note to your future self. You know, it's like time travel. So, uh, because six months from now, you'll go back to this program, you'll be like, now what was I doing? Um, especially when they're tricky parts of your code. You want to put a note in there to remind your future self, hey, don't, don't edit this, don't delete this, because it'll cause core dump later or something. Future self. All right. So, this, uh, underneath the comment, I'm printing out a headline statistics, and I'm going through, again, another for loop. I'm going through all the levels in my Plinko program, and I'm printing out the values, the results. Um, again, I'm using the printf statement to print out a string, bucket, and then some decimal number, colon, and then another decimal number, and a new line. So wherever you see the percent %d, that's going to get substituted with some decimal value, some integer value. Um, and the two variables that are getting substituted are i and count sub i in the count array, the, the ith element of the count array. So I'm printing out, just like you see over here, bucket zero, and then what's the count in bucket zero? Two or whatever. Bucket one, and what's the count in bucket one? So forth. So those two variables get substituted in order into the various percent fields. And then at the very end of my program, uh, I can either say return zero, because main is a function, or I can say exit zero, which is equivalent. Basically terminates the program and returns the zero status code. Remember, zero means OK. That's good. And that status code's important. If your program returns a status code of one and Rapture runs your program, Rapture will say, your program failed. It will tell the user, this program failed, right? So you, you got to make sure you return an exit, a zero exit status code. Otherwise, other programs like Rapture that depend on your program will say, burnt, invalid, didn't work, something went wrong. All right, so we got through it. That's the C language code. Now the next step is to actually, if somebody handed you that program, you gotta run it, you gotta do something with it. And with C language, you have to compile the program down to machine code. So there's a program called GCC, for example, the, the GNU free compiler in C. You can use whatever compiler you want, but in here we've got GCC installed. So GCC is the compiler, and you can give it some flags and arguments. The dash G argument is important. It says debugging. I want to turn on debugging so I can get into my program and figure out what the heck is wrong with it. Um, so that's a real important option when you're compiling. Uh, the next thing we do is we give it the C language program, Plinko.C, that we want to compile. We tell it to put the output dash O into Plinko, um, program called Plinko. So when it's done compiling, it will create an executable file called Plinko, and that's what you run. And then at the very end, we added dash LM, which is the math library. You know, your programs depend on other libraries a lot of times. Every pound and clue that you bring in probably brings in a library. And so at the end, you got to add all those dash LM, dash L rapture, dash L whatever when you're compiling stuff to bring those libraries in for your program. All right, so having done that now, if I've compiled my program, I'll have this executable called Plinko. And I can run it by saying dot slash Plinko. Um, the reason you say dot slash, a lot of times people don't have their executable path set up to look in the current directory. So you, if you say just Plinko, it may say, oh, I don't know where Plinko is. And you're like, right here, dummy, dot slash Plinko, this one right here. So dot slash Plinko is a way of saying this Plinko executable I just created 
dot is your current working directory, and in the current working directory, run Plinko. And it'll say number of drops, and you'll type in 500 or something like that. And then it'll go off and start spinning through that loop. Bzzz. And at the end, it'll print out the statistics, because it gets down to the bottom and it prints out all that printf stuff. So it'll show you bucket zero, bucket one, bucket two, and all that. It's interesting because our simulator is not very sophisticated, but it kind of works, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to the carnival and looked at a Plinko simulator, but when you're dropping, like wherever you're dropping, the coins tend to kind of pile up in the middle of that Plinko simulator. And in fact, I think if you know enough math, you can figure out it's a Gaussian distribution. Um, so what we're doing is we're doing a Monte Carlo simulation, which if we drop enough coins, will eventually uh, produce the Gaussian simulation, which the mathematicians will tell you that's the correct answer. Uh, so there's our simulator. So just to summarize everything that we just saw, and maybe a few other things too, um, this is what the C language program or C language sort of constructs look like. If you want to do a conditional thing, if you want to do an if statement in C language, it looks like that. You can say if and then some condition and then some statements. And C language also has if, like x is greater than zero, do this, else if x is less than zero, do this, and then there's also an all else fails, do that. And with C language, all those bits of code are all surrounded by curly braces. In other languages, like Python and Fortran, you don't have that. But C language, everything gets all wrapped up in curly braces like that. So you have to be careful about those curly braces. There's also something called a switch statement in C language. The switch statement is sort of like an if. It says if x is case one, then do this and break. If x is either case two or default, then do all this stuff, so and so forth. So the switch kind of looks at the first value, x, matches it up against one of the cases and jumps down and runs it. You notice you always got to break out of a case, because otherwise it'll do the statements and just keep going. If I didn't have that break statement there, it would do case one and then fall through and do case two and do case three and keep going. So watch out for that. It's another problem. Uh, on the looping side of things, lots of different ways to loop. You can do a while loop. While x is not zero, just keep doing that bunch of statements again and again and again. You can do the bunch of statements and then check at the bottom of the loop. Well, keep do a bunch of statements and keep doing it as long as x is less than 10. So either the while or the do while form is there. We talked about the for loop, setting the condition, checking it, and incrementing as we go. And then there are these statements break and continue. I, we already talked a little bit about break here. Break breaks you out of whatever you are in the middle of doing. And continue is sort of like break, but it, it doesn't break you out of the for loop. It'll take you back to the top and have you do it again. So when you hit a continue statement in a for loop, it just skips the rest and goes back up to the top and starts over. A lot of times people put that inside an if. They'll, they'll start a for loop and they'll say, well, if this is true, then skip the rest of this and go up to the top and keep going again. So uh, those break and continue statements are real useful in loops because they can get you out of loops or kind of take you on to the next case. So that's your cheat sheet of all the different programming statements. I'm going to switch gears now and kind of show you the same program, but now in Fortran. You can kind of see how different it is. In Fortran, one of the first things you'll notice is that everything is shifted over by six spaces. Every, everything in your Fortran program starts in column seven. And that's because back in the old days, in the 1800s, like when they used to use computers, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these, these gigantic uh, card punch machines. You ever see that? The, where you basically it's like a giant typewriter that has paper cards that go in the side. You ever been to a computer history museum? No? Uh, well, anyway, if you went to the computer history museum and you saw the giant keyboard, uh, you put in the paper card, and it turned out that the first like six columns, your program was made up of a series of cards. Each card was one line in your program. So by the, if I wanted to write this whole program, I'd end up with a whole deck, a stack of cards uh, representing the program. And they always reserved the first six lines, the first six, uh, I'm sorry, first six characters of each line um, for these kinds of control structures, which I'll show you down below. So Fortran is a very antique uh, kind of programming language based on these punched cards that they used to use. And we'll talk about some of the control characters like the plus and the C and the 10 in just a minute. But 
you're starting your program, you say program Plinko and make sure it's over in the seventh column. Otherwise, it won't work. Oh yeah, the other thing about punch cards is that punch cards can only go out to about 80 characters. So if your Fortran compiler is really strict and trying to be very, you know, old fashioned, then it will stop you at 80 characters because that's where the punch cards ran out of space. Um, modern Fortran compilers, of course, can go beyond that, and some of them do. Uh, but some compilers actually force the 80 character limit, and they'll give you weird compiler errors if you make long lines. All right, now, about those funny characters. If you're in the middle of a, a statement, um, in Fortran, I'm declaring my variables here. I've got an integer max and drop and i and pause, and I'm declaring all these variables, and I'm running into my 80 character limit, right? So what do I do when I'm trying to go beyond 80 characters? Well, you can continue on the next line, but you have to put a plus sign there, and it has to be exactly in that spot. So in column six, if you put a plus sign, or many compilers will let you put any character in that spot, usually it's just a plus sign by convention, but any character in that spot says, this is a continuation of the previous line. So, so you can read that as though I'm you know, continuing on. Integer max drop, I pause, count levels, and so forth. In C language, you can just sort of keep going, but in Fortran, you have to be real careful about the, the plus sign stuff because of all the punch card. Here's another magic character. If you start with a character in the very first column, then it marks the rest of the line as a comment. And usually people put a C there, like comment, kind of reminding you that this is a comment. But again, I think most Fortran compilers would say any character in that spot makes it a comment line. Um, so I put the word, I put a C there, and then I said set all counts to zero, and that's not programming stuff, that's just a note for my future self of what I'm trying to do here. And then finally, in C language, we had curly braces that kind of helped put all the code together. In Fortran, when you write a loop, you have to use numbers. So, so I can number a statement like, say, 10, continue, I can number that statement, and then I can set up a loop by saying, okay, do everything until 10, i equals 1, go up to levels plus 1, keep going, blah, blah, blah. So this is the way you write a loop in Fortran, is you have this do, um, do continue thing, and you have to number the continue statements. So the rest of the space is in between the first column, which is for comments, and the last column, which is for line continuation, you have, what, four other spots there, where you can put in line numbers, um, and hopefully you don't have to put too many of them in. Turns out it doesn't matter whether you called that statement one, or statement five, or statement 10, or statement 999, or whatever. Fortran doesn't care. You've got four columns there to use numbers, and then you just match up all the numbers for your loops. Isn't that interesting? This is like a, a walk through the computer history museum. Um, I forget, how many of you guys have actually used Fortran before? No, we asked you two, okay. We asked yesterday, and then I asked about your grandfathers. All right, all right, I remember. Uh, well, it's, you know, it turns out that the reason Fortran is stuck around, so you may, you know, now we're making fun of everybody's grandfathers, but the reason Fortran stuck around is because it's actually a very efficient language in terms of math. People spent years and years and years developing great math libraries in Fortran, and then they decided, you know, Fortran was sort of an old language, right? Um, but it turns out there's tons of code written in Fortran that is very good because of all the math libraries. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you sit down with your advisor and he says, okay, here's your code. And you're like, great, is it Python? No. Is it MATLAB? No, it's Fortran. And you're like, great, where's that lecture that, uh, where's that Plinko thing that I was supposed to be listening to? All right. A couple of more things. Now that you know the basic structure of this program, um, Fortran has variable declarations, but it also is old enough that they, they used to do this thing called implicit declaration, uh, declarations. It used to be in Fortran, anything that started like in the range of i to n was assumed to be an integer value. So if you created a variable called j, Fortran would assume that's an integer. k is an integer, of course, right? You actually see a lot of code using ij's and k's and things like that as integers. So in Fortran, it'll assume that those are integers. If you pick values like a to h or o to z, you get a real number. So if I choose a, a t for temperature, that would be a real number. Um, that's a real easy thing to do. You could, some people back in the 60s thought that was a great idea. But it turns out when you're writing large complex programs, that's the easiest way to shoot yourself in the foot. 
is that you declare something that you want to call one thing, and it turns out it accidentally makes it an integer. So in every program that I wrote, I always turn that off. It's better to be explicit about what you've got. So by saying implicit none, that says, don't assume anything about my variables. I'll tell you about every single one of them. So if I say implicit none, now it's up to me to define all those variables. Integer levels, integer max, integer drop, double precision rnum, all that stuff. Um, and that's safer because that way if I forget to declare a variable, the compiler will get mad at me. It won't assume that it has an integer value or something like that. This is sort of the way of defining constants, just like with the pound define in C language. Instead of the pound define, you can set integer levels and then parameter levels equals nine. Parameter is the thing in Fortran that says, all right, this thing is sort of a constant value, but I might change it the next time I compile it. And then I mentioned before about this do loop, the fact that you use statements like 10 to kind of tie everything up. So, um, in, in Fortran, I'm going through this loop here for i is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I'm going through and setting all the counts to 0. So in your mind, you can imagine it this way. Count 1 equals 0, count 2 equals 0, count 3 equals 0. And remember I said earlier in C language, all the indices started from 0. In Fortran and MATLAB, indices start from 1. So that's why we're starting from 1 here. All right, second half of my program. Fortran uses this really crazy notation for things like less than, greater than. Um, you know, there's a greater than symbol on the keyboard. Why not use that? I think back in the old days, there wasn't one there. Uh, so if you go back far enough, uh, it makes more sense. So Fortran has this crazy dot LT and dot LE and all that notation. So here's your cheat sheet of what it means when you're looking at an if statement. In this case, uh, I used more of a lengthy if statement to express it. It's a little easier to read. If my random number is less than 5, 0.5, I'm sorry, then pos equals pos minus 1, otherwise pos equals pos plus 1. That's exactly what I was doing in C language, except in C language it was one line of code. In Fortran it kind of was longer. A little more readable, but longer. Um, all right, so you use all those crazy operators, and there's even logical operators for ands and ors and all that. The other thing is when you're writing stuff out, Fortran's kind of funny. Um, Fortran has all this crazy stuff for formatting. Uh, an easy thing to do if you don't care about formatting is you can say, write six comma star. Six is, oh, you should know this, six is the unit number for standard out. Everybody knows that, right? So when you want to write to the screen, you write to six. Um, if you want to read in, you read from five, and there are all these file descriptors that were hard-coded back in the day with Fortran. Um, so anyway, you'll see this a lot. Uh, when you see people saying write six comma star, you can just read that as printf. That's, people use that all the time is just write it out to the screen. Write six comma star as printf. Um, here I'm writing to six again, but now I'm, instead of star, I'm using a specific format. I'm using format 99. And again, you can see I'm using line numbers. So which format? Format on line 99. And that format says I want to print out bucket and then an integer with five spaces, and then a colon, and an integer with five spaces. So again, I'm ex telling the computer program exactly how I want the output to appear with these letters, and integer with this many spaces, and all that kind of stuff. And then those are the two values, the i and the count sub i, are the two values that get substituted into that format line. So again, that's sort of the antique version of the printf. All right, and here's your cheat sheet too, similar cheat sheet for Fortran. Um, if you want to write an if statement in Fortran, it's similar to C, but it doesn't have the curly braces. It's if and then the parentheses, then a bunch of stuff, and end if. So you use then and end if instead of the curly braces to kind of mark your code. Um, there's an if, then, else if, then, and in this case, else if is one word. Um, else, and then all else fails, you can have those statements too. So those are the if statements. There is no switch statement in uh, Fortran, just if statements, but that's fine. Um, there's not really a while loop. Uh, this is back in the day before they invented the while loop. So what people used to do was use an if and a go to. Uh, I don't know, maybe your programming instructors probably told you never use go to. That's good advice. Never use go to, uh, except when you're writing a Fortran program because it's the only way to write a while loop. So 
you can start, you can mark the top of the while loop as something like 10 or 20 or whatever the number, and you say if x is less than 10, then do a bunch of stuff and then go back up to the top and keep going and keep going until finally you break out of the loop. The loop is done. You can do the same kind of thing for a do while thing where you start with a continue statement, you do a bunch of stuff and then you check the if at the bottom of the loop, just like a do while would, and go back up to the top. And then we already saw the for loop where Again, you're using line numbers to mark the bottom of the loop and going through. The, the for loop is the start and the end and the increment. So this says go from 1 to 10 in steps of 2. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. All right. So we made it through the Fortran program, too. Shoo! So now we just have to compile it. Um, the GNU Fortran compiler is called GFortran, the modern one. Uh, and again, just like the C language program, we say gfortran dash g says I want debugging, just like C language, turn on the debugging for me. Um, I give it the name of the program, plinko.f, and then I, I say dash o plinko. Um, in Fortran, you can also have libraries, but it turns out you don't need to. Fortran builds in a lot more libraries, the math libraries and everything. So you can add other libraries on in Fortran, but most of the time you don't need as many libraries as Fortran builds it in. So now I've got the same thing. And you notice it's called Plinko, and probably from this point on you can't really tell when I'm running that program Plinko, I can't really tell how it was written, whether it was written in C or Fortran. On the inside I wouldn't know, it just works the way it works. Um, just like the other C language version, the Fortran version will ask me number of drops, and I'll type in 500, and then it'll chug, 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 do its work, and then it'll print out the results. Um, one thing you notice, because I said I want an integer with five spaces, I get a very rigid looking output with, you know, spaces in here. Um, but uh, it might be slightly different than my C language version. Uh, but anyway, same stuff. And really, if I have the same random numbers, I should get exactly the same results. Of course, my random numbers might change each time I run the program, so it changes a little. All right, so now you've seen C, and now you've seen Fortran. I want to go back and talk about how we build programs and talk about makefiles a little bit. We saw makefiles just a little yesterday, and I think it's an important thing for you guys to know because uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll be writing your own programs. If they involve a compiler at all, you should have a makefile for your program. Why? Because when I'm compiling this program, GCC, blah, 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 and then I edit the program because there's a bug in it, and then I compile it again, and then I edit it again, and you just keep do doing this, right? Every time, as you're building a program, you, you edit, you compile, you test. You edit, you compile, you test it. You keep going through that loop. And if you keep having to type a big, long, gobbledygook line of complicated stuff, it's really irritating. It's easy to get it wrong. Um, also, the more complicated your programs, it's not just one line you have to type. You might have to do 50 lines like that that you have to type to build the whole thing. So, so the compiling part can get really complicated in a hurry. Instead, instead of typing all that stuff by hand uh, for the compiling, you can just say make. And when you say make, there's a program on Unix that looks for something called a make file, and it follows all the instructions inside of it. So if I say make, the make program looks for a make file, and the very first thing it finds is something called Plinko, and so it says, oh, okay, I'll build that. So how do I build Plinko? The first line says Plinko colon Plinko.c. That means Plinko depends on Plinko.c. So if you edit Plinko.c, the makefile is smart enough to know that you need to rebuild the program. So the makefile automatically looks at the dates of all the files and says, oh, you've just changed the program. Then if you tell it to make, it'll recompile because it knows I need to rebuild this because it depends on that. So makefile knows all the dependencies in your code. It knows that your program depends on this header file, this source file, and everything else. And the way you tell it is with that colon. You say Plinko depends on Plinko.c. Then the next line down, you have to tab over, and the tab's really important because a lot of times people write a make file and they put in a bunch of spaces because they're copying an example that they see somewhere. If you put in spaces, make file gets really mad. It has to be a tab. Why? I don't know. It was the 70s, and it seemed like a good idea at the time, right? Um, who knows what they were smoking back then. But you put in a tab, and then you put in the command that you would normally execute to build that. So just like you would have typed on the command line, gcc-g, blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, Makefile also has a bunch of different syntax so that instead of typing things exactly, you can put in all these weird dollar ats and things like that. And I'll, I'll save that for another day in terms of complexity. Um, but a very simple make file just says Plinko depends on Plinko.c, and whenever you need to rebuild it, just run this GCC line to rebuild it. You can have other things in the make file too. I also have a target called clean, and if I ever say make clean, then it'll do that. Clean depends on nothing, and when I say make clean, it's going to remove dash F, which means force all the dot O's and Plinko. So if I had a bunch of dot O files sitting around, those are things that are compiled by the compiler. It'll clean those up, and it'll get rid of the Plinko program and clean everything up. So now I can say make to build my program, and I can say make clean to get rid of my program and clean everything up. All right, so a very simple make file, and you can make it a lot more complicated. All right, so now, having done that, I can edit my program, and I can make. And I edit my program, and I can make. And you just keep doing that. And it's a whole lot easier, because I don't have to type all that gobbledygook, and I don't have to remember, wait, did I recompile that? No, I don't. If I just say make, it'll, it'll either do nothing, or recompile everything, or whatever it needs to do to make it. See, if you do make twice, no changes, does nothing. And then finally, I can say make clean at the end, and it'll clean everything up. It'll remove the dot O's and the Plinko, whatever I told it to get rid of. It'll clean everything up. All right. You're almost ready for your lab assignment. Almost. Um, what happens when somebody gives you a program, and you finally manage to get it to compile, and you try to run it, and it doesn't work? What happens then? So suppose I type Plinko, and it does this. You type in number of drops, and it says seg fault core dump. You guys ever see that? Seg fault core dump? Yeah. So that basically means something went horribly wrong in your program. You're probably trying to address memory that doesn't exist or using a null pointer or something. Um, and the program just can't continue. It doesn't know what to do. So it, it just stops, dies. So at this point, you got to figure out, well, all right, get it in, get it up on the rack, and figure out what went wrong. So there's a program in Unix called GDB. It goes along with GCC and G-Fortran. It's the GNU free debugger. So it's the debugger that works with all of the compilers. And if you've compiled, you remember we talked earlier about minus G. So if you compiled with minus G, then you can use GDB. And it'll work great. So GDB Plinko will start up GDB, give you a little GDB prompt in parentheses, and you can type in some simple commands. One simple command is L, and it will list your program out. So if you type L, you'll see the program. And you can remind yourself, oh yeah, uh, line 13 was the printf function. You can tell it to stop there and run it and so forth. So L lists your program. If you want to tell it to stop somewhere, like line 13, you can say break. Break 13, or, or B I think works too, but anyway. You can say break 13 and it'll set up a breakpoint so that when you run the program, it'll stop there and it'll let you check everything out before you continue on. All right, so I've got this breakpoint. Now if I say run, it'll run the program and it'll stop at 13, waiting for me to do something. I can look at some variables, I can print some stuff out. I can do n, n is next. If I type n, it'll do the next statement and then stop. Do the next statement and then stop. So you can kind of walk your way through the program just by saying n, 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 one statement at a time. When I say n here, it executes printf, and you can see it saying number of drops, and then it stops at the next statement. So if I say n again, it'll wait for me to type something and then continue on. So when I say n again, now it's doing the scanf, and it's just sitting there waiting. I type 500, and then it's done with the statement, and it continues on. Right. So I'm kind of walking my way through the program. And I can convince myself, as I'm saying n, that everything's working. I can get into a loop like this and see, oh, OK, i is 0. What does count look like? i is 1. What does count look like? And I can keep going next, next, next through the program. And I can convince myself, next, next, next. And if I print, p is print. If I p print i, then I can see, oh, OK, now I'm at the case where the loop is 1, and the loop is 2, and the loop is 3. So you can print stuff out, and you can figure out like where you are and what's going on in the program, and why it's core dumping or hung up or whatever. You can also do really fancy stuff with. Uh, there's a lot more to GNU Debugger. 
You can do things like say break at 24 if drop equal equal 3, which is really cool, because that way you can do a bunch of stuff and it'll get halfway into the loop and then it will break, as opposed to you going next, next, next until you're blue in the face, right? So you can do things like that. C is for continue. When you say C, it'll continue to the next breakpoint or to the end of the program. Um, so for example, it continues until it hits that next breakpoint, stops. Uh, and then at that point, I can print out other variables, drop and so forth. So in general, this is your little cheat sheet for GNU debugger. If you say L and give it a line number, it'll list your program. If you say break and give it a line number, it'll stop. You can say run and give it some command line arguments. It'll run your program. Um, you can say N for next and S for step and uh, C for continue and, and P for print and all that. So that's your cheat sheet of things when you're stuck inside GNU debugger and you're wondering what to do. These are the commands that you can use to, to work it out. All right. So it's time to do a lab assignment. And you can work your way through it yourself. Uh, this is going to be, you gonna, this is, you're going to love this. You gotta, you gotta really slog your way through this one. This is great. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, congratulations, you've inherited a program that almost works. So this is the situation you're going to face where the last student, grad student or whatever, wrote a program, and your advisor says, well, why don't you start with this and then go from there, right? And your advisor doesn't know because he hasn't tried it, but it turns out when you try it, it's completely broken. It doesn't work. First of all, you can't get it to compile, and then second of all, when you actually do get it to compile, it doesn't work, right? So you've got to figure out, you've never seen this thing before, and you've got to figure out what it's doing, how to get it to compile, and how to make it work. Um, this program is a lot like the Plinko program that we looked at, but it's a little different. It's a letter frequency counter. Um, so the idea is you, you run this program dot slash letters, and it'll say type in a sentence, and you type in hello world, and then it'll go through all the letters in that sentence that you typed, and it'll count up statistics. So for one thing, it'll count that there are two words. It ignores punctuation, by the way, uh, just looks at alphabetic characters. Um, but it'll count that there are two words, hello and world, so it prints out two words, and then it prints out the letter frequencies. There's one D, there's one E, and you know, two O's, and three L's, and goes through and counts up all the letter frequencies, right? So that's what it's supposed to do. And your advisor will swear to you that it works, and it does that, and the last student had it working. And he'll say, I don't know what you, I don't know what your problem is, that you can't make it work, right? Uh, so, all right, that's your challenge. You're, you're like, I can make it work, I can make anything work. So, what I want you to do is download one of these two, either one. You can use wget and then type in that path, and uh, either one of those will work, letters.c or letters.f. If you prefer C language, use letters.c. If you want to walk on the wild side with a punch card time machine, then use the letters.f for Fortran, either one. Your first job is going to be to make a make file. And that should always be your first job. Someone hands you a program that you have to compile. You say, well, I'm not going to do it by hand. I'll make a make file. So I want you to create a make file to compile either letters.c or letters.f. First job. And then I want you to use the make file to compile it. And as soon as you try to compile it, you're going to find there's errors in the program. So you're going to go through and at least get it to compile. And once you get it to compile and run it, you're going to find it doesn't work. And then I want you to get into the debugger and try to figure out why it doesn't work. And at the end of this, you will have done all of that. You will have made a make file. You will have fixed the program to the point where it compiles. You will have gotten into the debugger. You will have figured out everything that's wrong with the program. And you'll have a working program that looks like this. So let me walk you through the solution that I've got for this particular assignment. So I'm in my boot camp 2012 directory and I've got, no, where am I? I was in the right directory, dang it. All right, so there's two flavors of this exercise. I'll just walk through the C language version because I think most people were using that. Um, so there's a, a C language version here, and um, uh, I'll just copy that because um, this is sort of the solution already. Um, 
we make a new directory and copy letters.c into new. All right, so I've got this program now, letters.c, and I've got to try to make it work. So the first thing that I want to do is create myself a make file, because I'm going to be compiling it again and again and again, and it just makes it easier to have the make file so I don't have to type a bunch of crap. So my make file, uh, I say I've got a program called letters. Uh, that depends on letters.c, and then the next line down, I tab over. The tab's real important, otherwise make gets all mad at your file. And then I say what my compile command is going to be, gcc-g. You remember dash g is important because I want to debug this program. So always put the dash g in there to get the debugging info. I think a few of you might have stumbled into that in GDB. GDB wasn't showing you anything useful. It's because you, you were missing the minus g option. So I'm going to compile letters-c and put the output into a program called letters and uh, put in the math libraries or whatever else I need. I'm also going to make myself oops, um, a clean target. And the clean target just says if I want to start over, um, I can get rid of all the dot O's if there are any. There won't be in this case. And then the word, uh, the program letters that I compiled. So that's my make file. And as long as it's called make file with a capital M, like you see here, and as long as it's in the same directory as my program, uh, and as long as it has that format with the tabs and everything that we talked about, then I'll be all set to go. So now I can say make, and it goes ahead and runs the compiler program and, and uh, shows me all my errors. Now, that, it's good that I got a make file because I'm going to be making this a few times. I got to go through each one of these things. Always start at the top because when, when C language or any compiler encounters an error, it'll tell you the error and then it'll try to move on. And sometimes that error causes another error, which causes another error. And if you start at the bottom, you'll be like hopelessly confused. So start at the top and fix the first error and keep going until they tell you, try it again at some point. Um, all right. So the first thing it tells me is that on line 29, there's um, a variable called n words. It says n words is undeclared. All right. So I'll go into my editor and I go to line 29 and it tells me that the n-words here is undeclared. So I have to declare all my variables, right? But I'm like, wait a minute, right up here it says int n-words equals zero. Int n-words equals zero. And yet it's telling me n-words is undeclared. That is like the craziest thing in the world because it's declared. Now you notice, um, in this particular editor, just for readability, I turned off syntax highlighting. A lot of editors have syntax highlighting built into them, so you can kind of see what's going on in a file. Syntax highlighting is a very good thing. Um, let me show you another view of this same thing. If we go into the assignments and C and new, and we pull up my solution or my uh, assignment, this is what, you know, this is your brain on drugs. This is your brain on syntax highlighting. Syntax highlighting will, will highlight various keywords. So you notice like all of your variable declaration types, like int at the top, int, int, char, int, those are all in green. You notice words like for and while are all in red. You notice all of your, your um, character strings are shown here in purple, right? So it's really easy when you're looking at something with syntax highlighting to see all the parts of your program. Now you can see it the way the compiler sees it. This is the way the compiler is looking at your program. And one of the other things that the compiler does is it draws all comments in blue. So right here, for example, this is a comment. It's highlighted in blue, right? And up here we have some comments that are highlighted in blue. And you notice this is highlighted in blue. As far as the compiler is concerned, that declaration is a comment. Why is it a comment? Well, you remember in C language, comments start with slash star, and they keep going and keep going and keep going until it finds the closing star slash. That's a real easy mistake to make in C language. You have a comment that sort of goes and goes and goes and consumes your whole program. In this case, it consumed the variable declaration. And it's like, dang it, I didn't want it to do that. Um, I could do one of a couple of things. I could, I can end the comment here, and then all of a sudden now you notice it's colored differently. So as soon as I added that closing comment there, int n words equals zero shows up as if the compiler recognizes it. Um, 
some people also put the, oops, used to my VI. Some people also put the um, star slash, star slash at the end of each line and slash at the beginning just to avoid problems like that. Um, so you can also do your comments like that and try to keep them one line at a time. Um, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. The, the important thing is uh, it's actually nice to have a syntax highlighter when you're very confused about something because it'll show you what the compiler is seeing. So let me compile again. And you notice I get a little bit further. Now it's telling me the error is at line 31 and it's saying it expected a semicolon. So at line 31, it's saying it expected a semicolon. And you notice there is no semicolon. And the compiler saying it expected a semicolon. It's telling you what the problem is. In C language, every statement has to have a semicolon at the end of it. You can see that on the line above there's a semicolon, but there's not one here. So that's okay, I can fix it. And then I make again. It's telling me letters is undeclared on line 35. And so I go to line 35, and it's saying C greater than zero, C less than letters. And I say, wait a minute, I thought I had letters. I've used that somewhere. And if I go to the top of my program and I search for letters, it's there, right? But it's actually N letters. So, all right, I forgot. It was supposed to be N letters. So everywhere else, I was smart enough to say N letters, but not there. So I'll fix that and make again. I'm getting further, almost there. Line 47, it doesn't like uh, terminating quote character. So 47, uh, oh, okay, that's because it's telling me I didn't terminate the string. And yeah, it's right, I'm missing a quote character. Remember with printf, I have a string that says what I want printed out, letter, character, uh, some number, new line. And then these, the next things on the, the rest of the function call, those are the things I want substituted in place of the percents. So I was missing a quote character, just like the compiler said. And I make, now it finally works. Hooray, now I can run it. So I type letters, and it's not doing anything, but I can type, that's okay, hold on. Hello world, and it's not doing anything, right? Now people ask me, why isn't it doing anything? And the answer is, I don't know, ask the program, right? How do you ask the program? You get into GDB. When something doesn't work, your friend is GDB. You say GDB letters, and if you say L, it'll show you your program. So it kind of reminds you what's there. I'm going to set a breakpoint at line 22, because I want to get here and figure out what's going on. It should say, type in a sentence. So I'm going to run. And I'm not even getting to line 22. Where the heck am I? If I hit control C, it will tell me where I am. It shows me. I'm at line 19. I haven't even gotten to line 22 yet. And if I step, remember you use N for next, 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 next. I'm in this loop where it's going through and initializing the count. And if I print out I, it's zero. And if I go through a few more times and print out I, it's still zero. It's like stuck here, never going on in the loop. What's going on? Well, for i equals zero, starts at zero, while i is less than n letters, it's true, i. Oh, dang, it's supposed to be i plus plus on a loop, right? It's supposed to bump to the next value on the loop. All right, so I can quit that, and I'll edit, oops, not letters, but letters.c. Um, so now I go back there and fix my loop. So. I'll put in the plus plus. So see, a loop is supposed to look like that. For i equals zero, i is less than whatever, and then i plus plus. That moves it on to the next, to the next value. So now I have to make again, right? Because if you go try to run your program again, nothing's changed. If I'm running letters, it's still stuck. That's because I have to make again. I have to make the brand new copy, and now when I run letters, it's actually doing something different. So I can type in A, B, C, D, E, F, and, well, all right, it's sort of there. So it's sort of working now. I can see it's saying A, B, C, D, E, F. There's two words. But when I go to print it out, it just tells me there's a B, and there's a D, and there's an F. Dang it. All right. Let me see what's going on there. Why isn't it working? I don't know. Ask GDB. So in GDB, I'm going to go through the whole program, and I'm going to break down here at, like, 44. Run it, and I'm going to type A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. Now, at this point... I'm about to print out 
and words, which is two. That's good. And I'm also about to print out the count. I look at the count, and you can see A, B, C, D, E, F is good. So it should work. So now I'll continue. Dang it. The counts are right, but it's not printing it. What's going on? Let me take a look more closely. I'm going to run it again. Start over. A, B, C, D, E, F. All right. And now this time I'm going to step through. I'm stepping through and I'm printing out I is zero and I'm going to print out count sub zero or I can also say count sub I. Okay, one. So here's my print statement. I can even print out things like I plus A and kind of check everything. That's the character 97, which if you look up in the ASCII table is a lowercase a, right? So, uh, and I can print out count sub zero. And again, I convince myself that that's it. All right. So I print it out. Wait a minute. It's saying letter B and it's saying one. Like I thought I convinced myself that I was about to print letter A and it printed out letter B. And now when I'm going through my count, if I print out I, it's a two. Like I went from zero to two and it printed out letter B. Like what the heck? But if you look real closely and we go back through this, okay, I'm at two and I do that and now I'm at three and now I'm at four. Dang it! Like the I counter is all goofed up. And if you look real closely, you'll see right here there's an I++. plus plus. So when I was printing stuff out, I printed out I plus A, and then I printed out I count sub I, and then the plus plus after it says right after I print out the count, go ahead and move I. And then when I got up to the top of the loop, it moved it again. So every time through the loop, it was kind of bumping I by two, bumping it once when I wanted it to, and bumping it one more time when whoever wrote this program screwed it up. So anyway, go back to my program and take that out and try it again. Hooray! And now we can try other cases because I never trust my program. And everything works. So that's how you build and debug. And that's like the bread and butter of what you do when you're building, when you're doing software, right? Uh, sometimes you get a program that you inherit that you didn't have anything to do with and you got to figure it out. Sometimes you created the mess, but it's the, it's the old you. It's six months ago you. And hopefully six months ago you wrote some enough comments to kind of help future you figure it out. Um, but that's it. You make yourself a make file to make it easy to compile. You get into the debugger and you walk through your program line by line and uh, check every square inch of it. There are so many programs with so many bugs because nobody looked. You know, you just assume if your program runs that it works properly. Really, whenever you write a program, you should go through, watch it execute once. If you, if you, make, if you convince yourself once that everything looks good, then you're probably in pretty good shape. But uh, a lot of people just write code and then assume it's going to work perfectly the first time out. It never does.